This is a Toya. Yep, Spino, that is a fair response. This was a marine worm from the Cambrian period, and it was a slimy, gross, strange-looking little creepy crawly. I'd say shake its hand, but it doesn't have one. And, me being me, I'm going to dedicate an entire video to it. Silence, my little dinosaur co-host. I don't need it. Don't mind him, everyone. He just has a mind of his own sometimes. You know, there are plenty of prehistoric animals I will openly admit I would love to hug. This ain't one. This looks like one that would swallow you whole if it was big enough, like that leech does to that worm in that one video. If you know, you know, it's horrific. And that is also how this worm is thought to have eaten too, so I'm happy that this mini Kernictus is tiny. And as you were going to see, comparing this worm to the giant ones from King Kong is not an exaggeration at all. So, let's take a swim in the Cambrian Oceans and get right up close and personal with Atoya. This strange looking worm not only appears very alien looking, but also lived in a very alien world compared to Earth today. And I'm going to tell you all about both, as well as why, if you lived in the Cambrian as one of the local bottom dwelling fauna, this would have been one of the scariest predators in your world that subjected those it caught to an absolutely horrific fate. Tremors would be literally your reality, but you wouldn't be Burt Gummer. So if that sounds interesting, then please stick around as we talk about Atoya. The history of Atoya's fossils being discovered goes all the way back to 1911. The type species was named Atoya Walcott. The lectotype specimen was named USNM 57619. This animal is one of the most common macro fossils you can find in the Burgess Shale of British Columbia, which date back to 508 million years ago from the Cambrian period. That area is actually known for excellent preservation of soft-bodied organisms like Atoya. The body of the worm itself was divided into an anterior proboscis and a posterior trunk region, and some of our fossils beautifully preserved the body in high detail, letting us make out all the little details down to the number of spines on the body. Many of our fossils of this animal are intact, beautifully preserved, and sometimes we can even make out the worm's color in some. The color range of the animal varied between red, yellow, and tan. We actually have over 16 hundred fossilized specimens of Toya to study. This marine worm grew to an average of eight centimeters in length. Some did grow longer though, with bulk, width, and length all varying in various individuals. The trunk, the name of the main part of the body, was spacious and had a concentration of strong muscles here that served the same function that you see in gizzards and birds today. Because this animal lived in burrows in the bottom of the ocean, and our fossils come from what was once the foot of a high limestone reef. Due to it being a somewhat immobile animal, this position left it to being vulnerable to being buried in mud avalanches from the top of the reefs and cliffs. The worm is thought to have lived in U-shaped burrows as well, but some paleontologists do argue that the U-shape might just be because of post-mortem contraction in some specimens. The range of this animal possibly included modern-day Nevada, Utah, Spain, Western Canada, and China. However, the only conclusive place its fossils have been found is the Burgess Shale in British Columbia. These predatory little mini water graboids were one of the most abundant predators in the region that they called home. While far from the largest or even the most impressive Cambrian predator, they did make up for it in being rather ruthless with their prey. Their bodies were covered in hooks and spikes. Wow, they really were little water graboids. Forget calling them Cernictus, even though they ate the prey just like them. They're like a perfect, disgusting mix of the two. And if you've seen King Kong, you probably know where this is going. The spines on its body are thought to have been used to capture prey as it passed near the worm's U-shaped burrows. From these, it would extend its proboscis. Oh, God, it is so similar to Cernictus. Yuck. Once they had their prey in reach, they would then grab them and swallow them alive head first. And they were not picky. Atoya would eat other Atoya, slurping up its neighbors like a thick string of slimy spaghetti. And the fact that Atoya was a predator is also not debated. Fossilized gut contents prove it. This little worm was one of the most vicious predators in its corner of the ecosystem. It ate anything small enough it could get into its mouth, including its neighbors. Put it simply, this little worm was a terror in the Cambrian Oceans when most things were small enough to be swallowed whole by it 
Many animals met that horrific fate. Let me just spell it out for you. That horrific fate would be slowly digesting inside this long, slender body. Ugh. Ugh. That's horrific. Seeing it happen in King Kong is horrific enough. Nice to know that these smaller things actually existed, isn't it? Still not convinced? No? Okay. So let me set the scene here to show you just how scary it would be if you were small enough to be prey to this merciless animal. Picture yourself as a thing. And insert small, soft-bodied Cambrian marine animal of your choosing here. You might be a haplop forentus in this scenario. You're slinking along the sandy floor of the ocean among the corals and the reefs. When suddenly the sand around you opens up and before you know it, you're dragged down into the sand and sucked down and gulped up alive, trapped inside the long wriggling body with no escape as you are slowly crushed into paste by the gizzard-like walls. Then the worm, aggressive and merciless for something so small, buries itself again and you're gone. Like you were never there. What a way to go. Ugh. Yeah, I painted such a vivid picture in my own mind that I feel kind of dirty after saying that. Really though, it's just unsettling to picture life with these being, you know, big enough to be your predators. And that's the point I'm trying to make. It's completely alien, you know, to us when, you know, there was this time on Earth when that was the status quo though. You can imagine the Kernictus from King Kong as a honestly perfect example of what living with these might have been like, but I have one from real life that is good too. Look up marine worms today and see how aggressive they are. Um, does this picture ring any bells? Yeah, anyone else remember seeing videos of how horrifying this thing was when catching prey? Imagine this worm as a toya and you as the prey, and you have a very perfect idea of what I'm describing for you. And keep in mind and well that in the Cambrian period, most animals were small. Meaning, depending on the cards you were dealt, there was a very high chance that on average this worm would have been big enough to eat you like I just described if you had lived in the Cambrian. Be very thankful that you are not. <laughs> the Tullia itself lived in the mid to late Cambrian specifically. It lived in what is now the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin. Animals that lived in the oceans during the late Cambrian around the time that Atolia did include animals like sponges and corals to small early fish. You had things like jellyfish and cephalopods and some really weird looking bottom dwellers covered in spikes and a few larger animals too. The famous Anomalochirus, which was monster size relative to everything else alive at that time, appears only about three to four million years after our Atolia fossils do, so we can assume some bigger animals were probably swimming around while our little worm was, you know, sticking its head in the sand, tunneling around and burrowing around in search for prey, now acting more like a graboid than a mini Carnictus. The Kaya was another animal that existed in the Cambrian, and it was actually described by the same paleontologist who described Atoya in the same year too, Charles Walcott in 1911. The world that this little worm called home is a very different one than ours. It's like comparing Earth to another alien planet. Not only did most of the animals look alien with only a few faces around at this point that we would call familiar to us, but the land was all dry, barren, and just a rocky desert with no green, save for cyanobacteria colonies along the shoreline. And the atmosphere was not exactly pleasant. Though the temperature did fluctuate, there were very hot periods of time. Some of these warm events even coincide with different mass extinction events. To cooler ones, where we believe glaciers even existed at the South Pole, located at the time on Gondwana, an ancient supercontinent which formed between 800 and 600 million years ago and lasted up until 66 or so million years ago, with the final remnant breaking apart as recently as possibly 23 million years ago. This mass of land appeared... Long before and long outlasted Atoya, a real testament. By the time Atoya lived, the Cambrian explosion was just a distant memory. The Cambrian explosion was when complex life forms really sprung up, diversified, and took off, with some remnants of the earlier Ediacaran clinging on alongside the diverse number of new and bizarre faces. The Cambrian explosion was essentially when all groups of animals, or the ancestors of them that we have today, appear in the fossil record and put it very simply, this explosion happened over a very brief window of time, comparatively speaking. Animals became more complex too. Animals before this were very simple. They all appeared to do it very fast. Again, this is relatively speaking, this is occurring over millions of years, but it's 
happened with such speed and such suddenness that it is also referred to as the biological Big Bang. Burrowing marine animals like Atoya also destroyed the microbial mats that had covered the ocean floor before the explosion. In fact, openly swimming animals in the Cambrian were a rarity. Yes, you had things like jellyfish, early fish, swimming arthropods like Anomalochiris, but in the Cambrian, most of the animals were still seafloor dwelling, either burrowing into the sand or scuttling along the bottom. Due to most of the animals being bottom dwellers at this point, sharks weren't even a thing yet in these oceans. This means animals like Atoya were the terrors, and they just had to wait for something to crawl close enough to get grabbed. And then we know what happens next. I saw another video on YouTube call this the worm that terrorized the prehistoric oceans. And you know what? That title was absolutely right. Like I said at the start, tremors would literally be your reality if you lived in the Cambrian at this time, but you wouldn't be getting out of it like Bert Gummer always did. And that is all that there really is to say about Atoya. At the end of the day, despite having lots of fossils and being a really interesting animal in its own right, it's still simple and there was not much more going on with this animal that we could really get into. Yeah, Spino, sure, that's not funny. There's not much more that we could get into here. Atoya was a marine worm and a relatively simple animal. I mean, look at it again. It's a very simple design. It lived, burrowed, and ate what it could, couldn't really move super fast, and died out at some point in the Cambrian period. We don't even know when. It's not much of an epic. But it is a little piece of the story of prehistory, and one I'm glad we know about. There's just not much more about it to really talk about. You know, even though this is just a little marine worm, I do find this little fella interesting. If it was, you know, obvious by the fact I chose to dedicate a whole video to this instead of something else. I, I think part of it is, is because of the fact that it really reminds me of things such as the Carnictus or the Graboids. And a friend also pointed out that it resembles the giant Cambrian worms from Primeval too. So there's that. And I think what just grabbed my attention was not only those similarities, kind of, it's kind of a case of life imitating art but also completely independent of the art itself life really can be stranger than fiction sometimes and these little stories prove it and i'm all here for it it's just interesting and it makes this gross little marine worm interesting too maybe because like it's vaguely familiar to animals still around today but it comes from essentially an alien world and it's also an animal whose form of life is completely alien to us i think that's also why I find the idea of coexisting in a world with it when you're smaller than it and bite-sized to be so unnerving. It's just alien to picture because Atoya is almost alien compared to the animals that existed at the same time and the animals that exist today and how we perceive animals. It doesn't have a face or any features other than a mouth. It's just neat. And that's all I really think about it. It's neat. Now, next week, we're going to talk about another prehistoric animal that's larger, something more exciting, but also very bizarre looking. And I hope to see you there. And check out some of my other paleo videos in the description. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you for watching. Uh, no, actually, Spino, I don't.